Hello guys, uh, so we're inside my car again obviously. Uh, the right front seat is not installed at this moment but that has nothing to do with this video. It's just because I had to transport some rather large items lately. Uh, the seat will be reinstalled in a couple of days time. What I wanted to talk about is something very different. Uh, I have been on a lot of uh, hikes and uh, field trips lately and uh, my phone needed to be charged while I was driving. The same thing was also true for my camera that I'm obviously holding in my hand, that's why I can't show it to you. But I also have uh, two more uh, photo cameras that I carry around with me. So as you can imagine, uh, it was quite uh, hard to charge the items at the same time uh, while I was have just one jack here. And uh, for my phone I'm typically using this buck converter right here which transforms uh, or converts um, the 12 volt of the car battery to 5 volts DC, which can then be connected to the phone. Um, in an earlier hack I already installed a USB connector on here, uh, so that this thing that originally was uh, part of my navigation system could be used uh, to charge uh, all kinds of USB devices. Um, but uh, in addition I also have this um, device here which is actually a hacked UPS. It's a power inverter uh, that uh, transforms the 12 volt DC to 230 volts AC um, so that I have just uh, normal uh, electric outlets basically as they are typical here in Germany and I can use that uh, to plug in uh, the charger of my camera and also of my um, other photo cameras. And uh, you can see that this, uh, first of all uh, it's already a mess in here, all those uh, wires dangling around and then you have a couple of very loose connections. Uh, worst of them is actually this one which was of course uh, originally intended for the lighter of the car which I never use since I don't smoke uh, and I also wouldn't use it probably if I smoked. But uh, see the first problem is here that for example this buck converter is uh, sitting only so loosely uh, inside this jack that it uh, each time when I like drive about some kind of bump uh, or my car is shaking in any way uh, the thing gets disconnected and the phone stops charging. Happened a lot of the times and uh, it's really annoying. Same thing is of course true for the inverter. Uh, the inverter circuit by the way is actually very small, it's just uh, the case that is so large. It takes a lot of space, um, wires dangling around, again the same problem uh, that it's just sitting too loosely in here. And uh, uh, today I just about had it with this solution. What I will do is to remove this, uh, I don't know how to call it, uh, bucket or shelf or whatever and uh, I want to install um, a panel right here that will hold an outlet for 230 volts AC at 50 Hertz, um, a 12 volt, uh, another type of a 12 volt DC connector for self-made devices, um, USB um, jacks to charge USB devices and maybe also another 5 volt, uh, some more uh, mounting posts for 5 volt DC. So basically 230 volts, 12 volts and 5 volts on a panel. Yeah, and then I also thought about some switches here so that it could like flip around the license plate and shoot like missiles out of it. You know, like James Bond. Ah, okay, but more about that later. So let's get right into it. First of all, I will have to remove the plastic part that I will use as the base for my new control panel. In the process of this video, I will make permanent modifications to that part. And I could understand if you are concerned for your car's resale value. But in this case, it really doesn't matter. I guess I will never sell this car anyway. When I will eventually buy a new one, I will keep this car for experimental purposes. Removing the part involved nothing more than unscrewing four screws and removing one single connector from the back side of the jack. And this is what the remaining space looks like. Next I remove the front plastic part that is held in place by two little metal pins. And because I want to clean the rather dirty plastic, I temporarily remove the 12 volt jack. For cleaning the part I simply use some detergent and a toothbrush. In the next step I simply remove some protruding plastic parts with the help of a knife. And then two mounting holes are drilled into the part with the help of my drill press. I have now gone down into the basement where I will cut out a couple of pieces from this brand new aluminium sheet. I do that with the help of one of my angle grinders. And after returning back into the electronics shop, 
we can already see how these pieces will eventually form a new enclosure. But in order to hold the sheets together, a set of aluminium angle pieces have to be cut and pre-drilled. In order to increase stability, I will also attach a single piece to the plastic itself. And after drilling holes through the plastic and the front panel as well, I temporarily connect the parts with a couple of bolts in order to show you what it will look like eventually. But before I can go on, a large number of differently sized holes has to be drilled through the front panel. The original 12 volt car jack should still be usable. For large diameters in thin sheets of metal, a step drill is a good choice. But for the 230 volts electric outlet, I have to drill a ton of small holes through the front panel and file it all into shape, because I have no drill that can make holes of this size. And we also need mounting holes for the bolts. And the step drill is also used to drill a hole for two USB jacks into the panel. And after that I start to install all the jacks onto the front panel. And because I want to have a status LED for the power inverter and also a button to turn it on and off, more holes are drilled and those parts are installed as well. In the next step I use a couple of wires to connect the parts together, as far as it is possible at this point in time. I do that now because it will become harder and harder to reach the parts behind the front panel as I proceed with this project. After that is done we can start to work on the actual electronics. For that I open the enclosure of this charger and take out the little PCB that carries the buck converter that this device is based on. If you want to know more about buck converters I recommend you to watch my video SMPS tutorial part 3 which I will link in the video description. As I said before I hacked this charger a while ago and I actually made a little mistake back then. As you can see I connected the two data lines here, green and white, together and also connected them to ground. But it turns out that it is enough to simply connect the data lines together but not connect them to ground. If you don't do that there will still be 5 volt present at the plus 5 volt pin in your USB jack but there is a good chance that your phone for example will not go into charging mode if you plug it in. To back that information up let's take a quick look inside this USB charger. As you can see here, the two pins in the middle of the USB jack, being data plus and data minus, are simply connected together, but not connected to ground. And you can also find that same information in the Wikipedia article about USB. But as you can see here, there are different standards and you might run into problems. For example, if you're using Apple products. In order to mount the tiny board inside the case, I solder it onto a slightly larger piece of Vero board, which I bolt onto the plastic part. And after I have already soldered the two 4mm jacks to the output of the buck converter, I connect the USB jacks to those mounting posts, supplying them with 5 volts DC as well. And before I proceed with the build, let us test if it all works so far. And yes, it does work. We have 12 volts at the mounting posts, 5 volt on the 4mm jacks as well as on our USB jacks. The phone goes into charging mode as it should when plugged in. With that all working, it is time to work on the power inverter then. At first I was planning to use the inverter from inside the old UPS for this project. But the PCB is actually a bit too long. It would be possible to remove the filters and relays on the right side of the board and shorten it to fit it inside the case. The inverter would still work since the relays and filters were only needed when the UPS was used in charging mode. But since this is a double sided board with some control circuits on the bottom, I figured it was unreasonably much work to do this. But I guess that we will take a look at this circuit in some more theoretical future video about inverter technology. So instead I will tear down this little 150 watts power inverter and use its circuit for this project. A 
simple inverter like this can be bought for around 20 euros. It only delivers a simple square wave AC and no sinusoidal supply voltage. But this circuit is good enough to be used for my charging adapters and other modern low power devices. And as you can see, the inverter also comes with an integrated USB jack. But it's still a good thing that we have a separate buck converter for that job. This is simply a very wasteful linear regulator, which is also only rated for one quarter of the output current of the buck converter. If you want to know why linear regulators are in most cases less efficient than switching converters, watch SMPS tutorial part 2 and a link is again in the video description. I won't deliver a detailed description of how these power inverters work in this video, but I will definitely do that in a future episode. But let me just give you a very rudimentary explanation right now. The switching MOSFETs behind the tiny aluminium heat sinks on the right side, the ferrite core transformer, as well as a couple of other parts you can't really see from this perspective, are a part of a switching converter, typically a push-pull converter, that will convert the input voltage, here 12 volts DC, to a DC voltage of several hundred volts. We then have a second stage that consists of a MOSFET full bridge that periodically reverses the polarity of the high voltage DC with a frequency of, in this case, 50 Hz, effectively creating AC out of the DC of stage 1. And we will take a look at the actual waveform in just a minute. And yes, there are tons of different inverter topologies. But this is a very typical topology that can be found in a large percentage of cheap automotive type power inverters. And a series of minor modifications follows. I shorten the wires on the input side of the inverter and add another ferrite bead, because the original wire with the integrated bead is of poor quality. I also remove the old status LED from the enclosure and cut it off. Its wire will be used to connect to one of the LEDs on the front panel. But before I will install the PCB behind the front panel, let us test the inverter in a simple experimental setup. In the first setup I connected no load to the output of the inverter and supplied it with 12 volts DC from a lab power supply. The oscilloscope screen displays the output waveform of the inverter. I use a 10 to 1 probe. That means that each division of the screen represents 200 volts DC. So to read off the on-time value of the output voltage, just take a closer look at the screen. Here we now have a second setup in which I power the inverter with a 12 volt lead acid battery. The output is connected to a crude variable dummy load. It consists of 10 halogen lamps with a power rating of 50 watts at 230 volts each. The DMM displays the voltage across the lead acid battery. This test tells us that the inverter can really deliver an output power of 150 watts at least for a short period of time. The heat sinks are ridiculously small, but at least this device has a tiny fan that helps with the cooling. Next, new wires for the output voltage are soldered to the PCB and the board is then bolted to the lower section of its plastic enclosure. I want to install the enclosure in a half-open fashion to allow for better cooling. The fan is also fastened and then the entire inverter unit is bolted to the front panel. But I still need a way to use this button to turn the inverter on and off. For that I build up a so-called toggle switch with the NE555 timer. First I used a design with two relays, which were supposed to handle the comparatively high DC currents. And here is a little test. In the test, the conductive tip of the screwdriver acts as the button. But then I changed the design to one with a MOSFET instead of the relays. Here you can see the circuit diagram of the actual design. 
So with that being done, I installed the Vero board inside the case and finished all remaining wire connections and made another quick test. Everything worked fine, so I installed the device inside the car. The original connector could be used and the four screws were put back in place. And here you can see why you should have a screwdriver that can be used around angles. So this is what it now looks like. Pretty weird, I give you that, but that's just the way I like it. Now let's do a real life test. Ok, so the phone charges, the inverter works and the toggle switch is also doing its job. So what now basically remains for me to do is to put something under this rather sharp edge here and to do a little more long term testing of this device. By the way, if you wondered what I did with my car stereo here, there are two videos in which I added both an input jack as well as a Bluetooth receiver to that thing. And links to that can be found in the video description. There are also links of other car related projects I worked on in the past. So I hope that if you are new to this channel that you will check out those videos as well. And maybe if you like this you might want to become a Patreon supporter or make a donation. You can find information about that in the video description as well. And as always, I hope to see you soon.